Hello, everyone. It's really great to be here. Um, my name is Yossi Weisman. I'm a senior security researcher at Microsoft Defender for Cloud Research Team. And today I'm going to talk about lateral movements in Kubernetes. So this is the RSA disclaimer. You can take a few seconds to read it. And this is the agenda for today. Um, so um, we will start with a short overview of Kubernetes and its identities. Um, then we will talk about inner cluster lateral movements. Um, then we will move to the next topic, which is lateral movement from the cluster to the cloud. We will also talk about cross-cloud lateral movement. And then we'll talk about mitigations and detections, and we will have some key takeaways. Um, so let's start. Okay. So before we will talk about lateral movements in Kubernetes, um, let's talk for a moment about Kubernetes. And even before that, let's talk for a second about um, containers. Um, so what are containers? I'm sure that most of you are familiar with it, but just for the people who haven't worked with containers before, um, container is a unit of, so is a unit of software um, that packages um, your code, your application, and all of its dependencies. Um, so you can run it everywhere without worrying about the dependencies. Um, the executable package is called image, and at runtime, uh, it becomes a container that is running isolated from the other containers. Um, you can think of it like executable and a process. The image is like the exe executable, and at runtime, um, like executable becomes a process, so the image becomes a running container. Now, um, usually you don't want to run only one container on one computer, you want to run multiple containers and to do it on multiple computers. And that's why you need Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is a um, container orchestration system which manages a set of computers that are called nodes, and each one of them runs multiple containers. So this is how Kubernetes looks like. Um, we have two main parts. We have the control plan and we have the nodes. Uh, the control plan is what manages the cluster. It has multiple components. Um, what is especially interesting for us for this uh, session is the API server. The Kubernetes API server is the front end um, of our cluster. Every request to Kubernetes goes through the API server. For example, if I want to deploy a new container, I send a request to the API server. Then we have the nodes, um, which run the actual containers, our applications. And also, on each node, we have an agent that is called Kubelet. Um, and with this agent, Kubernetes can manage the nodes. In managed clusters, um, in managed cluster in the cloud, for example, AKS, EKS, or GKE, the control plan is fully managed by the cloud provider. It means that you as a user, you don't have a direct access to the control plan. Uh, the cloud provider manages manage the, the control plan for you. Um, so that's about uh, managed clusters. And one more thing that is important is that usually in Kubernetes, we don't talk about single containers. Actually, containers are not even objects in Kubernetes. Um, we took we talk about pods, which are the lowest level components um, in Kubernetes. And pod can run one or more container in it. If it runs more than one container, usually those containers in the same pod will be related to each other. Um, by the way, usually you don't create pods. You create higher level um, objects that eventually deploy pods. But in this session, we will remain in the pod level because eventually all the other um, controllers will deploy pods. All right, so now let's talk about identities in Kubernetes. Um, and when we are talking about identities in Kubernetes, we are actually talking about three main areas. The first one is how users or applications from outside the cluster authenticate with the cluster. So for example, how I as a user can deploy resources in my cluster, or how um, applications like a DevOps pipeline can deploy um, resources, or how can they authenticate with the cluster. The second one is how workloads in the cluster authenticate within the cluster. And the third one is how workloads in the cluster authenticate with resources in the cloud that are outside the cluster. For example, if I have an application in Kubernetes and my application needs access to a cloud storage. 
So my application somehow needs to authenticate with that cloud storage. So the question is, how does my application do it? And in this session, we're going to focus on point two and point three, because point two is relevant for um, inner cluster lateral movement, and point three is relevant for cluster to cloud lateral movement. All right, so before we are talking about lateral movements, we need to go over a few more terms um, that are related to Kubernetes authentication and authorization. Uh, the first one is service accounts, um, which represent an identity of an application in Kubernetes. Um, this term, by the way, is not unique only in Kubernetes. If you worked with GCP before, um, so you already know this term because they use the same term for application identity. The second one is RBAC, or role-based access control. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with it, not necessarily from Kubernetes. RBAC means that we have roles, which are set of rules or set of permissions, and we bind between an identity and um, the role. So let's see an example. So here we have service account one, service account two and three, and we have role A, B, and C. So in this case, service account um, one is bound to roles A and B, service account two is bound to role C, and service account three is also bound to role C. All right, so we usually use service accounts by attaching them to pods, um, allowing the pod to use the service account to authenticate with the API server. So here is the full, the full chain. Uh, we have a pod, and the pod has a service account attached to it. The service account can, ha can have several um, roles bound to it, and each role has several rules, uh, which are the permissions. For example, a permission to create new pods or a permission to read secrets. So here is the cluster again. This time you can see in pod A that it has a service account, and with this service account, pod A can authenticate um, with the API server. All right, so after we covered the basic terms, we can start to talk about lateral movement in Kubernetes, and the first type of lateral movement that we are going to see is inner cluster lateral movement. So um, for our scenario, let's assume that we have a compromised pod in our cluster. Now, pods can become compromised for multiple reasons. For example, let's say that I have a web application and, web, and my web application is vulnerable and somebody exploited um, this web application, so now I have a compromised pod in my cluster. So here is the cluster again, and let's say that pod A is compromised. So what is lateral movement in the cluster? It could be um, a movement from one pod to another pod. It could be a movement from a, one pod to a node, and ideally, Attackers would like to gain a cluster takeover, which means that they would have full control over the entire workload um, that run in the cluster. And the question is, of course, how can attackers leverage a compromised pod for a cluster takeover? In other words, what we are asking is, which tools do the attackers have to perform lateral movement in the cluster or cluster takeover? So here we can see two identity types um, that we have in the cluster. The first one is a service account of the pod um, that we just talked about. If attackers have access to pod A, they have access to the token of the service account used by pod A. Um, the second one, the second identity, is the nodes identity that is used by Kublet. So if attackers somehow manage to get access to the underlying node, to escape from the pod to the underlying node, or somehow they have access to the file system of the underlying node, and we're going to see an example soon. So in such cases, um, they, could also, they can also use um, the kubelet's identity, the node's identity. So how can attackers leverage those identities that we saw for cluster takeover? So the good news are that it becomes a bit more difficult because um, in newer versions of Kubernetes, there are some security features that restrict operation that can lead to, lat to lateral movement and cluster takeover. And here we can see two notable features. So the first one is that read, read secret permission is not enough for lateral movement anymore because in the past, Kubernetes stored tokens of service account as secrets objects and it was done automatically. So if I could read secrets, I could read tokens of service account and then use them for lateral movement. Um, this includes, of course, tokens of service accounts with high privileges in the cluster. 
In newer versions, um, it's not the case, and Kubernetes doesn't create such secrets automatically. So now if someone wants to acquire a token, um, so they need to call to a specific dedicated API that gives a short-lived token. The second thing is that a node takeover doesn't necessarily mean a cluster takeover anymore, because in the past, once you obtain, you obtain the node's identity that we saw before, um, you became practically a cluster admin, because this identity is very permissive, um, but in newer versions of Kubernetes, um, this identity is still very permissive, but it's restricted. What does it mean? So now it can only control resources that are deployed on that specific node. So even if I get the node's identity, I cannot control every resource in the cluster. So this is an important um, point. Um, by the way, it's done by um, something that is called node authorizer, node authorizer and the node restriction admission controller. So there were definitely some improvements um, in this area, but some common misconfigurations still allow lateral movement. And now we are going to see um, a real world example um, that actually was the root cause of a vulnerability um, in a containerized application. So um, what we have here is an application that has a permission to update itself. So in this case, we have a deployment resource um, that uses a service account that has permissions to update itself, which means it has permissions to update this particular deployment object. Now you can see in the role definition in the left um, that a resource name is specified, which means that this role is actually applicable only to a specific um, resource, um, in this case, it's called my app. So just to simplify what we see, let's say, for example, um, that we have a web application and the application has the permissions to update itself, its own resource, um, but not any, other, uh, not any other resource in the cluster. Now, maybe it sounds harmless because it can update only itself, but it means that the application can modify its own configuration. And specifically, it means that the application can change its configuration to run, to run a privileged container, and if the container is now privileged, it can access to the underlying node, to the no node's file system, and if it can access to the underlying node, it can access to the node's identity, like we said before. Now, if you remember, in the previous slide, we said that even if you get the node's identity, it doesn't guarantee you a cluster takeover anymore like it did before, but, when we, update our set, when we have permission to update our own, own configuration, we can do one more thing, and this is to specify the node that we want to be scheduled on. We can actually specify we want to be scheduled on node X. Um, we do it by using a node selector. So what we have now is the ability to deploy a privileged container and to do it on each node in the cluster, and that is practically a cluster takeover. So let's see how it, how it looks like. So um, here is the cluster again. The compromised pod changed the deployment configuration to, to run a privileged pod. Now uh, we have a new pod. This time it's privileged with access to the underlying node. Then we do the same thing, but we say that we want to be scheduled on node two. Then we do the same thing on node three. And now we have three privileged container, one, one on each node. So we have a cluster takeover. So, um, we saw an example of a permission that could lead to cluster takeover, and we said it's a real-world example. Um, but before we move on to the next topic, let's go over a few more permissions that also may lead to cluster takeover. Um, this is a partial list, of course. Um, so the first one is very similar to what we just saw. If you can create a new pod or controller, you can specify its configuration. You can specify, for example, to be, um, to be privileged, like, was, like we saw before. Uh, the second one is actually um, the example that we saw, but it could be any kind of controller. We saw an example of a deployment resource, but it could be also other types of uh, controllers. The third one is an interesting one. So as we said before, in newer versions of Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes doesn't automatically generate any more secrets um, which store the long-lived service account tokens. But users can still manually create such secrets. I can create a new secret and I can annotate it with the name of the service account that I want. So I can manually create such um, a secret with the service account token. In other words, it means that um, Kubernetes doesn't do it automatically, but it still supports 
to store such uh, tokens um, in secrets. Um, so if I can um, create a new secret and then I can read its value so I can get um, a long-lived token of any service account that I want. And the fourth one is the permission that you need in order to create a short-lived token by uh, the token request API. All right. So that was the inner cluster lateral movement. And now we will move to the second topic, which is lateral movement from the cluster to the cloud. So the first question is, why is it even an issue? Why should we be concerned about lateral movement from the cluster to the cloud? And the reason is that Kubernetes and cloud resources are tightly coupled. So first, workloads in the cluster um, that are running in the cluster might need access to cloud resources. For example, we said it, let's say that I have an application and my application needs access to cloud storage. So this is one example. Second, uh, managed clusters in the cloud use cloud services for their, for their own operation. For example, Kubernetes nodes are actually virtual machines. Kubernetes uses cloud load balancer for the networking in the cluster. So in other words, managed clusters in the cloud are just a bunch of cloud services. So obviously, the cluster should somehow to authenticate with the cloud provider. So the question is, how does the cluster authenticate with the cloud provider? And there are several methods to achieve that. In our session, we will go over four main ones. The first one is by storing cloud credentials on the node. The second, uh, we will, the second one uh, we will talk about is direct and indirect access to IMDS. And then we will talk about OADC or OpenID Connect. For each method, uh, we will show how attackers can leverage the method for lateral movement from the cluster to the cloud. So let's start, and the first one is um, storing cloud credentials on the node. So it used to be the default authentication method in Azure for AKS clusters. It's not the default one anymore. Um, in this method, AKS stores a file with the service principal credentials in each node in the cluster. So service principles are application identities in Azure. It's like a service account in Kubernetes. So in Azure, it's called service principles. And um, by default, this service principal has contributed role, which is a very permissive role, to the resource group that contains the cluster resources. Now, users can also add more permissions to this SPN, to this service principal, if they need to. For example, again, let's say that I need access, my workload needs access to a specific resource in the cloud, I can add more permissions if I need to. Um, and many times we see that users also add permissions that they don't necessarily need. Um, in this authentication method, access to the nodes file system means elevation to contribute to role in the resource group that hosts the cluster resources, like we said. So now let's see how attacker can leverage this method. All right, so here is our cluster again. Um, but this time, in addition to the service account of pod A, we also have um, service principal on the node. So we have two identities here. We have the service account and we have the Azure service principal. Now, let's say once again that pod A is compromised. Now, if the service account of pod A can create new pods in the cluster, or if the service account has permissions to create or update any controller in the cluster, like we saw before in the previous section, so it can create a new pod that mounts the service principal credential file. So now we have a backdoor container that is controlled by the attacker with cloud credentials in it. So with those credentials, uh, the attacker can authenticate with the cloud provider. So that was the first method. So as we said, it used to be the default one for AKS, default authentication method for, um, for AKS in the past. But from the attacker's perspective, from the attacker's perspective, there are two limitations here. The first one, it's only for Azure. So if attacker want to attack um, AWS, so this method is not uh, relevant. The second, the attacker need to somehow get access to a file from the underlying node, yeah, to the service principal file. In, most case, in many cases, it's not going to be an easy task, right? So in the next method that we're going to see, in the next authentication method, so first, it's the default authentication method for all major cloud providers. And second, um, attackers, um, it's not a requirement anymore for attackers. Attackers don't need access to the underlying node. 
So the second method, the second authentication method, is direct access to IMDS. IMDS, or Instance Metadata Service, is a special endpoint that is, that is accessible to VMs in the cloud. This type of service is implemented by all major cloud providers. It's implemented in Azure, AWS, and GCP. It allows VMs in the cloud to query data about themselves. For example, what's my cloud identifier? Uh, where am I deployed? What's my networking configuration? And also it allows VMs to request a token for the cloud identity attached to them. So all cloud providers allow you to attach identities to um, the virtual machines. Um, in Azure, it's uh, managed identities. It's called managed identities. In AWS, it's EC2 roles. In GCP, it's service account. But each one, each, each cloud provider has um, this similar concept. And here you can see how those API calls look like in each cloud provider. It means in each cloud provider, how can I acquire a token for the identity attached to the node? Now, it's important to say that this endpoint, IMDS, the instance, instance metadata service, is not, um, it's not protected. It doesn't require any authentication. Uh, for security, it relies on the fact that only the VM can access to its own metadata service. Um, so in managed clusters in the cloud, the Kubernetes nodes are actually VMs. Those VMs, like every other VM, also has metadata service. And by default, the running pods can also access to their nodes metadata service. Therefore, pods can query tokens of the nodes' um, identities. And the permissions of those identities um, really depend uh, first on the cloud provider, because each cloud provider has different default configurations. And second, it relies, it relies on the specific environment, because each environment can um, be different. So um, now what we're going to see is we are going to um, go over the various cloud providers, um, and we will see what are the default configurations, and then we will see how attackers can leverage those. So we are going to start with Azure. Um, so AKS clusters use several managed identities for their operation. Man managed identities are cloud identities that are managed by Azure, that are fully managed by Azure. It means that you as a user, user you don't have to um, care about their credentials, it's, man it's fully managed by Azure. Um, so users can change the default permissions um, that the managed identities have, or they can also attach more managed identities to their nodes, depends on their needs. So let's see what are the default um, managed identities and what, what permissions do they have. So this is a list of the default managed identities used by AKS. Um, some of them are quite powerful. Uh, in red, you can see that in some configurations of AKS, uh, the managed identities have contributed a role to the nodes resource group. Um, those are in red. And also, AKS uses a managed identity to pull images from the registry, um, which is the permission, it's the managed identity in the second row. Um, and again, users can also add ma more managed identities if they need to, or they can change the default uh, permissions of the existing ones. It's similar in AWS. Now we're talking about AWS. So EKS um, clusters use EC2 roles for their operation. Uh, they include permissions to pull images from the container registry, like we saw in AKS. They also have permissions to read the compute environment and uh, permission to the networking configuration of the cluster. Now we're talking about GKE in Google. So GKE also uses such cloud ident identities. GKE uses IAM service accounts, not to be confused with the Kubernetes service accounts. IAM service accounts are application identities in GCP. Similar concept to um, Azure SPN. By default, GKE uses the default compute service account of the project. Um, this service account has editor role, which is very permissive and allow you to do for almost anything in the project. Um, however, um, the permissions are limited by, what called, um, by what's called access scopes. Access scopes are um, the APIs that the computer can access to. Um, but even with these limitations, even with the limitation of the access scopes, um, this service account, this default service account that UKE uses um, still is quite powerful, and it can read, for example, um, data from all the, um, it can read data from the, all the cloud storages in the project. 
as you can see here in the image below. So how does lateral movement from the cluster to the cloud would look like? So here is our cluster once again with pod A, which is compromised. Now uh, we are going to, um, let's uh, keep only one node so it would be more convenient. Um, and this node has made it as a server like every other VM uh, in the cloud. Now the pod can retrieve a token for the cloud identity that belongs to the node. The metadata server returns a valid token, and with this token, all depends on the permissions, the pod can query the cloud API. For example, read files from a cloud storage, it could be list secrets from a secret store, and even list credentials of other Kubernetes cluster. Again, it all depends on the permissions that this service account has. So what is the problem that we just saw? We actually saw two main problems. The first one is that pods can freely access to the um, identities of their underlying nodes, right? That's one thing. And the, sec the second thing is that in some cases, pods actually need access to cloud resources. They need cloud identities. But we don't want them to share the same identity. We don't want that all the pods in our cluster will share, will share the, same, the same identity. Um, what we want is to allocate specific identity to each pod that needs, that, needs the, the needs, that needs access to the cloud. And we want to make sure that pods can only access to their own identities. And we are going to see um, two methods to achieve those goals. So um, the first one is indirect access to IMDS. We are not going to elaborate too much about it because it's not commonly used anymore. Um, in this method, when a pod calls IMDS, the traffic is redirected to a local server, which is Kubernetes aware, meaning it knows which pod called it. Then the local server queries the actual IMDS on the pod's behalf and, re and retrieve a specific identity that belongs to this um, pod that is allocated to this pod. Um, this method was implemented by, a by, in Azure, it was implemented by AAD pod identity. Um, that is currently in deprecation. So let's see how it looks like um, in AID pod identity. So the first step is that the traffic of pod A is intercepted and redirected to a local server. Then the local server requests pod A identity from the metadata service. And then the local server returns the token back to pod A and now pod A has a cloud identity, a cloud identity token that it can use. What are the problems with this method? So the first thing is that it wor it's working only in Linux because um, the redirection, um, sorry, the interception of the traffic is, um, done by, is made by IP tables. Uh, the second thing is that the local server um, identifies the querying, the querying pod based on the pod's IP address. Uh, it means that th this method is prone to our poisoning so to mitigate this issue, to, mit to mitigate the our poisoning possibility, AD pod identity supports only network configurations that cannot be attacked by our poisoning. Um, so for example, the basic network config configuration in Kubernetes, uh, which is called Kubnet, uh, is not supported because Kubernet is prone to our poisoning. So um, this option is not ideal, um, the indirect access to IMDS. And now we will see another option. Um, and this is the last authentication method that we are going to see. And it's based on OIDC or Open ID Connect. Uh, in this method, uh, first of all, this method is implemented by all major cloud providers, Azure, AWS, and GCP. And here you can see how each cloud provider calls it. Um, in GCP, they actually use in their implementation some aspects of the previous concept that we saw of intercepting the traffic of IMDS to a local server. But uh, in general, all the cloud providers work in a similar way. Uh, in this method, the Kubernetes cluster is used, is used as an OIDC identity provider. Uh, it means that the cloud identity platforms such as Azure Active Directory or AWS IAM, um, so they can trust tokens that are issued by the cluster. 
And because of this trust, application in the cluster can exchange a Kubernetes service account token with a valid cloud token. And this is a big advantage of this method because it allows Pod to authenticate with the cloud using their own native Kubernetes identity, which is um, the service account. Um, because what we saw so far in all the other methods, when a pod wanted to access to, to the cloud, it needed somehow to acquire um, a cloud identity token. Um, we saw, for example, by using IMDS. Um, but now the pods can actually use their native service accounts. So um, this is um, a big advantage here. So the way it works is users can bind between a Kubernetes service account and a cloud identity. After this binding, which is called federation, applications can exchange the Kubernetes service account token with the correlating cloud identity token. So let's see um, the flow, how it works like, how it, how it looks like. So first, Kubelet uh, projects a signed service account token to the pod. Uh, this is a valid JWT token that is signed by the cluster. Then the pod send it to the cloud identity service. Again, for example, in Azure, it would be Azure Active Directory, and request to exchange the service account token with the cloud identity token. Now the cloud identity service verifies um, that this service account token is indeed legitimate and was issued by the trusted cluster. It does it by using the cluster OIDC endpoint. And if the ver verification is successful, then uh, the cloud identity service will return a cloud identity token. So now our pod has a cloud identity token and the pod can use it to authenticate with the cloud resources or cloud services that the pods need, for example, with the cloud storage or SQL or secret store, whatever it needs. And before we move on, let's talk for a second about GCP. Because in GCP, um, there is something interesting. Um, in GCP, there is a unified identity pool for the entire project. It means that there is a single binding between a cloud identity and a Kubernetes service account. And the Kubernetes service account is represented by its name and the name of its namespace. So here we can see an example. So we have two clusters. We have cluster A and cluster B. And um, both have a namespace with the same name. Uh, in this case, it's called monitoring and a service account with the same name, um, SA1. And it means that both, uh, both service accounts will be bound to the same cloud identity, in this case, uh, my cloud app. And now let's say that we have another cluster in our project, cluster C. And let's say that this cluster is compromised. So now if the attackers can create a namespace and a service account, they can impersonate to the cloud identity because there is only one binding between service account and the cloud identity per project. So now the attacker has access to the cloud identity by creating resources with the cert only with, the cert with certain names in the cluster. So what we can see here is that we must trust all the clusters in our project because many times we consider the cluster as our security boundary. But here we can see once again that the actual security boundary is a project because if I don't trust one of the clusters, so it's a problem because someone can use, if I have a malicious cluster or compromised cluster in my project, a attacker can use it to impersonate to cloud identity that is used by other clusters in the project. All right. So, before we will talk about mitigations and detections, uh, we will show one more thing, and uh, this is cross-cloud lateral movement. Um, so as you understood, throughout the session, we are trying to figure out what is our security boundary. So at the beginning, we saw that the container is not necessarily our security boundary, right? Because we saw, for example, that in certain cases, um, if my container is compromised, so the attacker can, mo attacker can move laterally to other containers. So the container is probably not the security boundary. And then we said, all right, so maybe the cluster is our security boundary. Um, but then we saw that even in default configurations, it's not necessarily the case because in many cases, uh, even in default configurations, containers, compromised pods in the cluster have permissions to external cloud resources that are outside the cluster. 
So the cluster is not necessarily our, our security boundary as well. And now we are asking something else. We are asking whether our cloud workload is a security boundary, because it meaning, let's say that I have multi-cloud environment, okay? Uh, for example, some of my resources are in Azure and some are in AWS. And let's say that we have a compromised pod in AKS in the Azure environment. Does it mean that my resources in AWS are safe? Um, so we're going to see that sometimes the answer is no. There are several possible um, cross-cloud lateral movement scenarios in Kubernetes. Um, we will focus in this talk about multi-cloud supply chain attacks. All right. So um, this is a simple scenario. Um, we have a Kubernetes cluster um, that is in one cloud provider. Um, in this example, it's AWS. We have an EKS um, cluster. And the EKS cluster in AWS um, uses images from a registry in a different cloud provider. In this case, it's um, registry in Azure. It's ACR, um, ACR. This kind of multi-cloud architecture is actually quite common. So this is our architecture. Now, let's say that there is a malicious user or a compromised, us compromised user that has permission to push images to the registry in Azure. Uh, so the malicious user um, can push malicious images to the registry. Now, this is a classic uh, supply chain attack, right? Uh, now the malicious images are pulled by EKS, um, and by cluster to cloud lateral movement techniques that we saw, um, the attacker, um, the malicious actor, can access to resources in AWS, for example, S3 buckets or secrets. So this is a classic supply chain attack. But um, this malicious user is not necessarily a human user. Um, it could be a workload that runs in AKS, um, which has permissions to the container registry. It's not necessarily a human user. Um, now, if you're asking yourself, why would my workload in AKS have permissions to push images to a registry. So just to make things more interesting, uh, we actually recently discovered a campaign uh, that targets um, Jenkins servers uh, that are running in Kubernetes. Um, and it makes sense, for example, yeah, as an example, that Jenkins servers has permissions uh, to push images for the, um, uh, for the CICD process. They want to push the built images to the registry. Um, so this, so, um, so what we see here could be a real threat in multi-cloud environment. So what we've seen so far, we started with inner cluster lateral movement. Then we talked about different methods of cluster to cloud authentication and how attackers can leverage each method. And then we talked, uh, we just talked about cross-cloud lateral movement. And now you probably ask yourself how we can, um, as defenders, what can we do about it? How can we um, detect and mitigate those threats? So let's talk about it and let's start with, um, we will start with detections. So as we already saw, when we are talking about Kubernetes, um, we must consider uh, both the Kubernetes level and the cloud, the cloud provider level. And of course, this applies also when it comes to detections and mitigations. So we'll start with Kubernetes. So in Kubernetes, we have a very powerful tool uh, for monitoring. Um, it's called Kubernetes Audit Log or Kubeaudit. And it basically allows you to monitor the Kubernetes API server. So it gives you a really good visibility to what's going on in the API server. Um, so you can see, for example, uh, deployments of abnormal images. Um, you can see reconnaissance activity in the cluster. You can see when somebody tries to, for example, read secrets. So um, this is um, Kubernetes. And in the cloud, all cloud providers have auditing services, uh, which allow you to track the behavior of the cloud identities. And this, of course, also includes uh, the identities that are used by Kubernetes clusters. Um, so here we can see in the image an example from Azure. In Azure, uh, there is a service, that is a service that is called Azure Activity Log. Uh, 
And here you can see a managed identity that is used by Kubernetes, uh, which reads storage account keys. Um, so if you see such thing, maybe you want, you want to analyze it and investigate it. Um, there are also similar auditing services in other cloud providers. Um, for example, CloudTrail in AWS and Cloud Audit Logs um, in GCP. All right. So uh, now let's talk about mitigations. So in December, uh, we released um, at Microsoft the third version of the threat metrics for Kubernetes. Um, the first version was published back in 2020. The threat metrics um, is a knowledge base of attacking techniques of Kubernetes um, that is built in the format of MITRE attack. Um, and the new version of the threat metrics now also contains mitigation techniques that we're going to see shortly. The threat metrics is open source. It's completely open sourced um, and you can all um, use it. Um, and you can find it in the address um, that appears here. All right, so let's see how it looks like. So this is the new threat metrics. This is the new version of the threat metrics for Kubernetes. And let's see how we can use it. So um, let's see the lateral movement tactic because we talked about lateral movement. So let's go to the lateral movement tactic and let's pick one of the techniques. Um, <coughs> for example, let's pick access cloud resources. So um, we'll click on it. And uh, this technique basically talks about um, lateral movements from the cluster to the cloud. Um, that's what uh, we talked about in this session. And here you can find um, the description of this technique. And down here, you can now find the mitigation techniques um, that can help you to, mitig to mitigate uh, this risk. And that's the new thing in the new version of the threat metrics. So let's pick one. Uh, for example, let's pick allocate specific identities to pods. And this is the description of the mitigation, uh, which talks about giving specific um, cloud identities or specific identities to the various pods um, when it's needed. Um, let's see another example. Um, we, go, we will go to lateral movement uh, once again, but this time let's pick another technique. Let's pick container service account. Um, this technique talks about leveraging the service account for lateral movement in the cluster. And once again, um, in addition to the description, you can find um, mitigations for this technique. So let's pick one. Let's pick um, disable service account auto mount. And here's the description of this mitigation. So um, the threat metrics is very useful tool. Um, and the new version not only gives you visibility to the, threat, to the threats like the previous one, um, but by using the threat metrics, um, now you can also find mitigations that um, gives you practical tools um, to prevent uh, the risk. All right. So now we'll talk about uh, some key takeaways from this session. So the first one, the first key takeaway uh, um, is that Kubernetes is complex, as you understood um, from this session. And when it comes to Kubernetes, you must implement a holistic strategy um, for the security. Um, this approach must include not only the cluster itself. You have basically several levels here. You have first the workloads themsel them themselves the, to monitor the applications that are running. Then you need to monitor the cluster itself, the control plan of the cluster like we saw, but also the cloud, um, the cloud level to monitor the cloud identities and the cloud resources that the um, the cluster uses. Second, um, as we saw in this session, identities are key aspect in Kubernetes security. 
Um, you should monitor the activity and give them only the minimal needed permissions. So this is another thing. So first of all, monitor uh, the activity of the identities. And second, of course, as always, adhere to the least privilege principle. Last thing, um, it's always better to prevent a threat um, than handle a security incident. I'm sure that all of you know it. Um, so use mitigation techniques um, to prevent uh, possible threats. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed the session and you found it interesting. <laughs> <laughs>